Very good. So um, uh, we just put the uh, tonight's agenda over here. Um, the, the title is uh, Rebuilding Finance. Um, we're going to talk about the uh, basic introduction about myself and uh, the project. And um, uh, Dustin is going to talk about the uh, uh, basically uh, what, what's going on and what's the next next steps uh, for the one chain, um, uh, all the projects we, we have. And also, we're going to talk about the uh, accelerator and future projects coming up. And then, then we have a QA Q and A uh, session. Okay, cool. Uh, for some some of you uh, who don't know uh, about me or the the project, just uh, give a quick uh, introduction. Um, I got into the uh, space pretty early uh, uh, in the year 2000, 2012 and We had a little uh, DF fund in uh, Austin, uh, Texas. And before I, I went to Austin, I stand, uh, spent around 20 years uh, in the IT industry, uh, doing um, uh, mostly in the e-commerce, uh, e on the e-commerce uh, software development. And um, I actually uh, uh, got into the, um, you know, startups as well for for uh, public listed companies in the U.S. And uh, I took that company, um, actually took the technology and the, um, um, hang on a second. I learned how, how the business works and also the uh, technology from Europe. And uh, took it to China in back in two, 2005, and um, and started two companies in, in China. Um, there was 2005 and 2007. Um, and um, and before uh, there was uh, before that, I was spent uh, around 14 years in in uh, Columbus, Ohio. So. Uh, and uh, I pretty much have a, a mixed background of uh, economics uh, and um, business consulting. I spent some time in the um, uh, securities, basically help the big companies to get uh, public listed IPO uh, back in China. So a little bit background in the uh, financial back, uh, you know, financial area as well. Um, so that's why. Um, uh, I'm very interested in the financial world, and um, uh, but in 2013, uh, uh, with all the investment, uh, big returns on the Bitcoin, I start looking to the software development, um, uh, and uh, work with some folks in Austin, Texas, um, and uh, um, and at, at that time. Uh, um, I think I met um, Dustin in in Austin, and uh, some of the some of you might know um, uh, David Johnson. Uh, he was uh, our investor, and uh, we created a, a little company called Factum uh, back in 2014. Um, at that time, it was a uh, we we're trying to build a data layer on top of uh, Bitcoin. Um, it was really back. I think early at that time, not too many ICOs. And then we were the one following uh, Ethereum. So um, at that time, it was pretty tough. Uh, it was a big um, uh, market meltdown in 20, uh, 2013. But we did the ICO. It was pretty tough. But um, uh, we, we, were, we were able to raise enough money to keep going. And um, the project wasn't very bad. Um, it w the, the coin was... Uh, Top ten for quite some time. It was listed number eight uh, on the coin ca market cap for a long, long time, and um, and also got um, interviewed by uh, the Economist um, for the famous uh, 20, 2015 October edition, the Trust Machine, and that uh, we got very famous around the world. And at that time, uh, I was invited back to China, and uh, I was responsible for the China market expansion as well. And uh, started realizing that uh, China market is so so big. Uh, I, I had the impression that uh, China's market, um, you know, for the for the uh, blockchain might be bigger than the rest of the world combined at that time because of the mining and all the uh, 
the people participating in the whole industry. So uh, at the same time, uh, we we also met some uh, difficulty to um, uh, to get the customers uh, for for uh, factoring in China because of the uh, regulations, uh, government regulations, and um, restriction for the um, uh, data security things like that. So uh, I was advised that um, I need to build a um, build a um, Baidu instead of instead of Google, so that's why um, I decided to come back to China in 2016 um, and build a company called uh, uh, Wang Glu. So at that time in 2016, um, things are kind of happening in two different worlds. One is on the uh, digital currency side. There, you know, more and more digital currency coming out, more ICO and more ICO coming out. And on on the Ethereum at that time, also on, on Bitcoin world. And uh, on the other side, um, also there are you know um, traditional traditional companies they cannot get loans in China. We're trying to explore what we can do uh, to help these companies get uh, financed. And also a lot of people uh, without banking access. And we were thinking how we can use blockchain to help them. So we were trying to bridge these two worlds and, um, um, and trying to figure out how to, um, how to come up with a solution, uh, not only for China, but also for the whole world. So that's why I think in, in the end of 2016, uh, we started working on the one chain uh, idea. It was incubated by the company called Wanglu. Um, the reason uh, for that was when we deploy multiple um, uh, private chains, we call it consortium chains for the uh, enterprise, including the government uh, institutions, we realized that sooner or later we have to uh, get all these cons consortium chains connected. And, um, and we took the first three characters um, a Wang Glu uh, and make it Wang Chain. And Wang actually started, I mean, is, um, it stands for Wide Area Network. And uh, in Chinese, Wang is also um, means 10,000, 10,000 chains. And then we want, I think in the future, we will have uh, many, many chains. We, we have to get them connected. Um, Let's see. So we have at that time we had, we built a, a global team, and uh, I think um, based on my experience with Factum, um, we have to have a global team, and uh, that's very important for any um, you know uh, blockchain project to be successful. We have to build a global team. So um, I I work with uh, Dustin in Austin and build a team in in Austin also. Uh, in many different places around the world. So we're talking about the uh, technical advantages. And uh, look at the graph on the left. What we're trying to do is trying to uh, build a bridge between all these uh, different blockchains, not only the public chains, but also private chains. And uh, if you look at the, uh, the bottom, uh, we actually have um, a concept called the land chain, and that's where we started. And um, local area network, uh, consortium chains or private chains. And um, these enterprise solutions that we even pro provide today, and uh, for some of the companies we work together, and we provide the solutions for, uh, for the enterprises, um, and also some of, the, some of the companies, they wanna issue tokens. And um, we help them to build the solutions, and uh, they will be automatically connected to Wenchi and this whole ecosystem. And Dustin will give you uh, more details about uh, those projects. And uh, what we're trying to do is build a, uh, you know, uh, something called Internet of Blockchains, right? Um, in, I think we, uh, we have many different uh, key technologies over here. Um, one is um, uh, privacy protections. Uh, so whatever the transactions on one chain, uh, we will have privacy protection. 
and uh, w which will have two different layers. One is for the uh, native coins, uh, one coin, and also any uh, tokens created on, on top of one chain. Um, the other one is smart contracts. Um, one chain is based on um, the Ethereum's code base, so automatically inherit uh, all the um, uh, smart contracts. And, and also a cross chain, right? If you look at the, the graph over here, uh, the private chain's uh, assets can be moved to uh, one chain, and also the public chain uh, assets can be moved to one chain. And uh, in the one chain, you can, all these different assets can be uh, programmed in the small contracts. And, um, uh, and I'll give you more details about how these uh, uh, three different technologies are so important. And also the goal um, of the um, of this platform is to uh, integrate any public chain as long as they are using the um, public key and the private key uh, scheme, uh, we, we should be able to uh, get connected. So based on this kind of um, all these um, uh, goals, uh, we came up with, uh, you know, uh, all kinds of design. Uh, uh, solutions at the time, we look look at many many uh, different options, and uh, we spend at least um, uh, six months to come with the right uh, right solution. And at the end, we figure that these three key te technologies uh, are, are required in order to create this infrastructure. The first one is uh, privacy protection. As I mentioned, uh, this is very important. And then we look at uh, different options as well, uh, like ZK Snark and, and many, other, many others. And we settle down on the um, Monero style ring signatures with one time account. And then we, we ran into some issues with how we can uh, come up, uh, you know, integration between the a narrow style uh, privacy protection with small contracts, and we came up with the uh, uh, stem uh, stem systems, so that the gas when uh, the small contract uh, is executed, um, the whoever is paying for the for the gas uh, can be hided with the with a stem system. So what it means is uh, when you want to issue. Um, um, Privacy token, you want to send a, a privacy token from one address to another. First, you want to buy um, uh, buy a, a stamp, uh, basically like postage, and then you put put on the envelope and send it out uh, and put it in, in the, uh, um, you, you know, um, uh, post office. And then uh, when it mail out, uh, nobody can track where that is coming from, right? Um, for the for the um, one coin uh, ecosystem, we support two types of privacy protection. And one is for the native coin, and um, and the other one is for the uh, privacy tokens. And uh, we use different mechanisms in order to uh, ac accomplish that. The second one is uh, cross chain. And also, we spend a lot of time, and we pick the uh, secure multi-party computation, um, and also thre threshold key sharing. Uh, this one came from um, a Chinese scientist uh, called uh, Mr. Yao, Professor Yao. He's a um, he's a uh, Chinese ch Chinese born, but grew up in Taiwan, but uh, educated in U.S. Um, he's a uh, only. Uh, Turing Award winner, uh, only Chinese Turing Award winner, um, and uh, his famous uh, SMPC theory was was widely uh, accepted. And we actually know this professor. He's currently in Beijing, and um, we were inspired by his theory, and also um, want to experiment with his uh, theory. And uh, we have a group of team looking to that. And then finally, figure out, um, you know, we can and use that scheme 
to to uh, control the private key uh, for any chain, uh, basically similar similar to sharding, but with with a group of, group of decentralized nodes uh, to control uh, a locked account in a different chain, and we uh, uh, a group of um, um, uh, uh, you know researchers got together and um, try try the POC. We 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 tested in in, in our lab, and finally. Uh, figure that out, and it, uh, we we actually um, you know wrote paper and uh, got verified by by different uh, professors and uh, researchers. Figure we figure out that it should work. So after in, in, uh, you know long time of research, you figure out that uh, you know uh, we have a solution, and um, uh, the cross chain. Um, Cross-chain technology with this, with our technology, can uh, allow us to um, uh, integrate with any chain uh, without having to modify uh, the original chain. So the third key technology is smart contracts. As everybody knows, this is very, very important. Um, although the smart contracts on Ethereum has a lot of problems, um, but uh, we are very confident that um, with more a bigger and bigger community uh, building the um, you know solidity uh, small contracts on Ethereum um, and with uh, former verification and uh, many other technologies, we will make the smart contracts and more and more secure. We we decided to use Ethereum because Ethereum has bigger. A developers community around the world, and uh, um, I, I've been an investor of uh, Ethereum, and I know that uh, the Ethereum is a core development team pretty well. So, um, I, so that's why we pick um, Ethereum's uh, code base to start with. And also, uh, there are many uh, develop, development tools out there, and we can we can use the existing uh, development tools. As, as well as the existing uh, smart contract code uh, out there in the in the uh, Ethereum community. So with, with these three three key technologies, we can build the uh, the new infrastructure uh, to get connected uh, with all these uh, public blockchains and and also private blockchains. So here's a long term uh, vision. Uh, what we're trying to build for for one chain, uh, I think it's very important to build an ecosystem, right? Uh, with with um, um, the Ethereum itself, um, you know, uh, and uh, I think it's very important. You you have to build the um, uh, uh, the apps and the applications on top of that, and then you have bigger and bigger community, right? So we borrow the same idea. We're trying to expand it. And at the end, uh, we see the vision for Wenchain is we're trying to create the infrastructure to bridge the assets, basically the digital assets, and, and also uh, uh, the capital that is available, the one that uh, wants to get into the, um, uh, the new uh, digital, digital economy. So for all the capital available, uh, either from the uh, institution investors or individual investors, Either they have fiat money or uh, digital tokens. Uh, we can let them in with different um, uh, format. Uh, with we can set up funds. Uh, we we can we call them WAN funds, and uh, we we'll let them to come in as tokens or equities. We also have uh, traditional companies, and all of that will will allow the uh, the capital to come in. But at the same time, we we'll have many many assets available. Once we are connected with different chains, and for example, um, uh, Ethereum, uh, any of the ERC20 tokens will be available. Right? And whatever um, the ICO or cross sale available on Ethereum, um, we, we, we can, once we can get connected with Ethereum, all those ICOs will be available to all the all the cap capital on top of one chain. But at the same time, one chain can do the same thing uh, using the 
uh, small contract similar like a ERC20 token, and we can create um, ICOs on top of one chain. And with privacy protection uh, technology, we can even create a, a, a privacy token uh, or privacy token uh, cross sale. And um, and uh, once we connect it with both Ethereum and um, and Bitcoin, we can create um, a small contract or cross sale that will accept with multiple coins. So that's how we bridge the uh, the assets, digital assets with capital. At the same time, in the ecosystem, we will partner with many third party providers and build many applications. So this will more will be more like a uh, Android, uh, Android uh, system. It will be open for any third party to participate and to build this uh, new infrastructure. Uh, so that's the vision. Uh, Dustin, you want to continue with uh, uh, your sure. vision? Yeah. yeah. Hey, thanks, Jack. Um, how's it going, everybody? Uh, Dustin Byington here, president of WanChain. And uh, we can give you a little bit of background uh, and uh, on our vision here about uh, why we're so focused on rebuilding the financial services industry. Uh, my background is coming from uh, the traditional financial services industry. And uh, what we see here is that uh, the real innovation is that of the digital asset. Um, it's a new atomic unit that we can use uh, to create an entire financial stack off of. Um, and the effects of it are really profound. Uh, to kind of understand, um, to understand it, we have to understand a little bit about uh, what digitization is and why it's important. Uh, when you digitize something, uh, you turn it into uh, take it from something that's physical, uh, and you turn it into the take it into the realm of zeros and ones. Um, Peter Diamandis, uh, founder of X Prize and Singular University, um, is uh, really kind of uh, been um, has been speaking a lot about the impacts of digitization, and his argument is that when you digitize something, it hops on an exponential curve. An exponential curve is a, a doubling over some period of time. And, um, and we see from the, uh, the traditional photography industry that when we digitize the photograph, it had these really profound impacts on the entire industry. Uh, the photograph, um, you know, the, the megapixels started off at 0 0.01 and then 0 0.02 and then 0 0.04. They were doubling, uh, but they were deceptively doubling. And that's the, the beginning part of the curve here. Um, and that's the point when, yeah, you're having this, you know, it's technically it is exponential, but the problem is that you can't really tell that it's going to be disruptive. Uh, it's not till that that technology gets to a point that it's actually usable. Let's get to four, eight, 16, 32 megapixels that really starts changing that industry, um, and having really disruptive impacts on that industry. Um, and then at some point it actually dematerializes and that the, uh, the photograph itself kind of not only the photograph itself turns into zeros and ones, but so too do does the, the camera. The camera becomes a, a digital app that lives on your phone. Um, and so this completely sort of upends the entire, has upended the entire, like not only the, the photograph industry, but kind of the, the larger media industry. And with the uh, digitization of the asset, uh, we anticipate a similar kind of uh, tra massively transformative impact on the financial services industry, and uh, and so we're building WanChain to to speed up that impact and to to bring about that realization of the next generation of financial services. And so to give you kind of some idea of the the, the speed of pace here, um, let's see if this video will work for us. Give us one second. Well, it might not have luck here. <laughs> well, um, so these, uh, unfortunately, this video is not loading for us, but um, if you look at this bar graph on the bottom, um, what this bar graph on the bottom is is the, uh, the digital asset issuance over time. And so uh, on the far left, uh, we have the, the very first issuance of, uh, you know, um, I guess this was uh, Ethereum, 
the first ICO in January 14. Um, and then you got, oh, you know, really not a lot happened. I guess Factum was what, Jack Quick, somewhere on here mm-hmm. in, um, in um, like December of uh, 14. And then uh, um, since January 14 with Ethereum, there was just, you know, a trickling of assets. And then after uh, 16 happens, we've got the Dow here. That's that big kind of bar after January 16th and still not a whole lot. And then all of a sudden in uh, 2017, you just have this, you know, explosion of digital assets. Um, and uh, it's just, it's really accelerating. And even though, you know, the regulators around the world are trying to sort of, are trying to regulate it, um, we don't think that that's going to slow down. It might shift and it might, you know, we might call these by a different name. They might be, um, you know, have various forms of regulation that are required by them in different jurisdictions. But the cat's out of the bag. Uh, digital assets are here to stay, uh, and they are going to profoundly impact um, not only our economy, but the global economy. Uh, the problem is that each one of these circles here that we're looking at, um, these are all uh, effectively islands. Um, each one of these assets is isolated from the other. Um, it's very much like the days of the intranet before we had a global internet that was connecting all of them. Um, and so it looks something like this. Um, so here we have... You know, over here we've got this like this little island, uh, and this maybe this is Bitcoin, and uh, and this this car right here is a Lambo, but it's still you know there's still so much you can do by yourself on an island, uh, no matter how big and how big the house is and how sweet the car and the boat are, it's just kind of boring. You're just kind of sitting there by yourself. Uh, but once you connect this island to the other islands around you, you get this like flourishing economic activity. Uh, so what, that's what WanChain is doing. WanChain is a bridge to the world's digital assets. Uh, and we believe that, that this is the, the bridges that we're building will unlock a tremendous amount of economic utility, again, not only for our ecosystem, but the larger global financial ecosystem. And, um, and so one, one visualization is that uh, you can think of, of WanChain. So it's, you know, we're all on blockchain. Jack talked earlier how we're, you know, we're built off the Ethereum code base. Uh, and you, what you can do is you can visualize that um, what we do is we take this very, this Turing complete uh, um, blockchain with uh, privacy protection. And then we go build bridges to all the various uh, world's digital assets. And um, along each of these bridges um, moves, uh, moves the digital asset. So, you know, Ethereum can get deposited on WanChain, Bitcoin can get deposited on WanChain, Litecoin can be deposited on WanChain. Uh, and then once we have um, this uh, blockchain with all the, these assets on it, then uh, things like uh, decentralized exchanges are merely applications that are built on top of WanChain. And, and it becomes actually trivial to do some, to build uh, some really powerful applications or to do things like, uh, you know, building um, index token for something, for example, is, is something excited about uh, because when you have say the top 10 coins on one blockchain it's just a matter of putting them into a smart contract and issuing out another token that represents them and so this uh, we're starting to see uh, i'll get into it in a little bit later some of the projects we're lo- working on but um the the power of the platform is, is starting to really uh be on display and uh with all the asset the applications we're building working on um another another like mental model um, that you can use to think about WAN chain is to just think about imagine if Ethereum, um, you know, if you had Ethereum with privacy protection and all the protocol tokens. Um, so, you know, things like uh, Ether Delta are uh, currently limited to the galaxy of uh, ERC 20s. But uh, when you build decentralizing chains on uh, WAN chain, not only do they benefit of the, the privacy protection, but they also get access to the, the universe of protocol tokens. Uh, this is also true for things like lending platforms. Um, you know, a lot of these, we're talking to a, a number of different lending platforms, and uh, it's only, there are only, there's only so much you can do lending ERC-20s back and forth. But when you can start putting, you know, Bitcoin into a contract and, and lending and get borrowing against that to receive, you know, Litecoin or Zcash, things start to get really interesting really fast. And um, so this is this is the vision here is that, you know, we're WanChain is building uh, financial infrastructure. It's like, uh, you know, Wall Street, you know, Wall Street, that's an island. Um, and with WanChain, we have this like 
financial infrastructure, but in the soil are all these different digital assets that you can build applications on top of. And so right now we're in the process of, um, and so these, you know, these apps can vary from um, things like in aforementioned uh, exchanges or um, lending applications, asset management tools, index tokens, uh, and that's just on the financial services side. Um, and, you know, we are a touring complete blockchain, um, and so we can, um, you know, we can the whole the whole realm of applications, uh, general purpose applications and enterprise and healthcare can be built on WAN chain. Uh, we've been talking a lot about uh, financial services because that's where we have some some really unique advantages. But uh, we're starting to get into um, looking more and more at enterprise and uh, healthcare because they too can take advantage of this cross chain technology and also privacy. Um, especially in the healthcare space, was you know it's just not suitable for a lot of these you know HIPAA compliance and things like that for them to build on uh, public totally um, totally transparent blockchains. And um, so right now, one of the really exciting things is that we're uh, we've been uh, in the business unit that I'm running. We've been uh, working on our our WAN chain accelerator, which is helping a um, now um, um, we'll be announcing six projects at the Dubai conference um, that uh, that focus on uh, various aspects of the stack um, one of them is a um, one of them is a stable coin that we're pretty uh, that's a very innovative approach to um, thinking about some of solving some of the uh, the black known kind of uh, black swan issues with currently existing stable coins um, another is an asset management tool um, another is a lending platform um, we have one that's a, a compliance a framework that uh, it's kind of like you can if it was done with our tokens. Effectively, what's going to happen is um, where where I see the industry going and, and where we'll be pushing it is for uh, uh, basically we'll have currently you have uh, exchanges that are handling the regulation. So exchanges are smart um, in the kind of legacy world. The exchange is what says, hey. I am going to allow Jack to transfer this asset to Dustin. The asset's dumb, whether it's you know a security, a traditional security, or um, a, a bond. There's no intelligence in the asset, um, and so the exchange is the one that has all the regulation packed into it. Um, but now with smart assets, what we can do is we can plug intelligence into the assets. And so these assets won't allow themselves to be transferred unless the other party is follow some set of compliance framework. So the other party is uh, has gone through KYC and AML or is accredited via the some designation of a specific uh, jurisdiction. Um, and so we're really we're really excited about this. And this means that uh, WanChain is going to support security tokens actually much faster than I was anticipating. Uh, I was kind of thinking earlier that security tokens were going to take quite a while for us to to sort out, but um, this sort of compliance. Taking baking the compliance right into the tokens itself uh, means that uh, we can accelerate that process. And so all these projects right now are moving through the WAN chain accelerator. Um, and so we are working with them closely to to get them ready for launch. And uh, in Dubai, we'll be telling uh, more and more about it. And there's there's also a batch of uh, enterprise projects that have you know kind of like uh, millions of customers and you know VC backed um, that are looking to get into the blockchain space and leverage our technology and digital assets and so um, we'll also be announcing those if anybody has interest in uh, learning more about it we'll be attending it's uh, the um, world blockchain forum uh, uh, mo levin's conference in dubai on uh, april 16th um, there's actually two conferences in dubai on that date so make sure you go to the right one uh, it's keynote.ae is the website um, so we'll be there along with these six projects and we'll have quite a, a long you know speaking engagement we'll be diving into details of all of these um, and telling also a little bit more about the accelerator. Uh, I know some folks have been kind of like saying, and hey, you know, where are the updates? What's been going on? Uh, we, I, I promise you, we have we have all been working uh, diligently here. Uh, it's part of a, you know, we just kind of been keeping quiet because every time we we say something on online, it's it's just barrage of comments about when, when, and etc. So, um, you know, you'll see in April just exactly what we've been what we've been working on. Um, sitting next to my buddy Lee Nee here. Who's been hasn't been hasn't been sleeping uh, every day. So um, and uh, so then I guess we can tell a little bit about the roadmap. Um, 
the the plan here is um, so Wenchain 1.0, uh, you know, was, we which we launched is, is really exciting. We have the world's first smart contract platform with ring signatures. Uh, that's live. That exists. Um, it's not uh, you know it's not a white paper. It's not testnet. Mainnet is up, and people are building on it. And uh, and then 2.0 will be going with um, you know Ethereum cross chain transactions. Um, 3.0 will be Bitcoin cross chain, uh, and then 4.0 will be doing uh, consortium chains. And uh, you know, they kind of expect that um, uh, in, in initially um, will be these these networks are kind of like um, you know the vision is that these this network becomes Godzilla, but it starts off as like an egg. Uh, and like a little chicken. And so you have to kind of like protect these networks. And so in the early days, uh, there will be um, these networks are kind of like start off slightly permissioned and closed. Um, and then we open them up over time and bring in more and more validators, outside validators, outside parties. Um, and so that's also not quite reflected here, but that's also a big part of the technical roadmap. Uh, when you're launching your own blockchain, it's, um, you know, you have to take security first and foremost, because these are, you know, these are digital assets. And, um, and so that's, you know, so over time, we'll also be opening up the network. Um, and so that's, that's it for the roadmap. And oh, Jack wants to jump in. Yeah, and I just want to add, add a little more, right? Uh, we have two things that we're working on very um, diligently uh, in, the, in the past few months after 1.0. Uh, one is uh, 2.0 design. Um, we have uh, been working, uh, you know, for several months, um, and uh, pretty much the, the, the solutions are finalized, and uh, we have a, a, a whole team working on it. Um, and uh, also at the same time, we are trying to improve 1.0 at the uh, same time, right? And we are doing the ledger support, as you all know. Um, it's been uh, tested, and we're working closely with ledger support team, and we'll release that uh, version pretty soon. So that's where we are. Uh, we, based on our, our current design, we are very confident that we should be able to deliver uh, 2.0 uh, code base uh, very soon. And uh, by the mid-year, we should have that. Uh, uh, integration with the Ethereum. And uh, I think that with a certain um, limitation, we should be able to uh, deliver 3.0 uh, ahead of schedule. That's what we hope for. Yeah. Look, that's great, guys. That's been a fantastic overview of everything about the project. So it's um, yeah. a great amount of information, and we've got a lot of questions. So do you mind if we move on to them? Yeah, hang on sure. a second. Uh, we want to. Show the. How do, we, how do we do this? Are we back? No, uh, we have I think to. We're back. Now. Oh, we're back. Can you see us? We can see your screen. Uh, um, oh, I see. No. I think we should cancel the uh, sharing. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Now you're back. Okay, great. So, was there more information you had in the another? Story? Yeah, uh, we we also want to talk about uh, our roadshow, uh, our plan. I think we uh, we put out the schedule. Do we have the schedule somewhere? Um, we just uh, went to Hong Kong uh, in the past few days. Um, a team of uh, three of us went to. Uh, Hong Kong, you want to say, come say hi, Justin. Yeah, that, that was actually going to be one of my questions. I was going to, yeah, uh, yeah ask how the reception was in Hong Kong because I spent time with you guys in my. This is Justin Lau. Hey guys, going on, Toby? Uh, hi, Justin. How are you? Hi. Hey, you can see. So Justin's helping us with a lot of our crypto finance apps. He comes from the also from the financial services world, hedge fund world. So uh, he's been uh, in the accelerator. He's been uh, we kind of have a lot of different project managers that we drop into each of the projects to help them. You know what? What you end up happening happen is you get you get these uh, these people with a lot of like domain expertise uh, and great vision, but uh, it's it's a whole other thing to to launch a successful uh, uh, project. Uh, a lot of unknowns, and so uh, thankfully, you know, we've been through this process, um, you know, Jack, quite a few times. Um, and so there's a lot of uh, you know, there's a lot of like, kind of like landmines everywhere into taking you know that idea and that vision and, and making it a reality, and so. Uh, Justin's been helping us do that, um, and we have quite a few other team members too that are also working directly with these applications to help them to navigate. And Lini is another. Here, this is here, here, what's the this is here's Lini. Hi guys. So, yeah. So, Hi. Uh, hey, 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 h
Sydney. So Sydney, yeah, yeah. Oh, Sydney. Oh, Sydney. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I'm Chesswood guy. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. So, uh, yeah, I remember spending time with you guys in Miami. You guys were almost the only show in town. How's the reception been at uh, Token 2049 in uh, Hong Kong and South by Southwest and a few of the other things you've been attending? Is the hype yeah. still... South by Southwest first? Yeah, South by is great. You know, we had the, the home court advantage there, being from Austin, and um, uh, we were the, we're the founding patron of the, uh, the Austin Blockchain Collective. And which is a group of uh, now 60, there's 67 blockchain projects in Austin. And so, you know, being a platform is very, you know, I, I kind of just think about networks all the time, both uh, uh, virtual networks and physical networks. So we're the only platform in Austin and with all these, um, with all this budding, you know, activity in the blockchain space, um, I've been working to, to pull all these, these projects together. Um, and uh, a lot of them are very interested in building on WAN chain longer term. And um, so the, the reception was really good. We, we spoke on a panel about uh, just sort of like how, uh, how much activity is happening in Austin. And then in Hong Kong, uh, we gave, uh, Jack gave a talk about China and um, about his, uh, his journey in China and all the activity that's happening still continues to happen in China. Uh, and so uh, we're fond of saying that we're not only cross-chain but uh, cross-culture. And so I think there's a big value into kind of also building a bridge between uh, the East and West. Yeah, that's fantastic. I've actually got a lot of questions about China as well. But Tobias, uh, just to give a little bit more update on what's coming up, uh, there's a, um, uh, I think uh, in the, this weekend, uh, we're going to have a, a blockchain forum uh, in Beijing. Uh, we are uh, having uh, multiple projects, uh, basically uh, have a mini conference uh, in Beijing. Um, that's uh, March 24th and 26th. Uh, we're going to have um, uh, a global uh, blockchain conference in Hangzhou. Um, we actually invited uh, many, uh, you know, blockchain uh, companies around the world in, into that uh, place. Uh, it's a G G20, uh, G20 um, a place, uh, I think G20, right? Yeah, G20 uh, on 26. Uh, it's a one-day event. We also invited uh, Ion and Icon. Uh, to join us, or and also Kaiba Network um, as well. Uh, so we want to come up with the uh, uh, you know roadmap for the um, interoperability alliance and trying to trying to uh, create a, a next steps and how we want to want to work together. And uh, we also invited the um, the government officials uh, to join us, them uh, to back us. Uh, to come up with the standards, basically, uh, for the future TCP/IP or the uh, Internet of Blockchain. So I think uh, it's, all these are small steps, but I, I think it's very important for the uh, alliance to move forward to get the uh, uh, you know um, backups from the uh, from the government and also from the uh, from the other companies as well. I think we're trying to expand the alliance. We, we will come up uh, some kind of rules to attract uh, attract more, um, you know, um, companies, blockchain companies, join our alliance. Great, great. And the, the one question I'm going to have to ask. April fourth. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. One okay, question go I'm going to have to ask for my safety, otherwise I won't be able to leave the building. Yeah. And it's best coming from you guys is. Not, not so much when, but what is going on with the exchanges? Because I think everyone's, uh, yeah, everyone wants to know. Well, you want to take that one? Yeah, I mean, it's, um, it's kind of, I've, I've said before I'd be surprised if it was, you know, later than what, February, or early March. Well, I'm surprised. Like, I, I just, I, I am, and uh, we all are. Um, it's, it really is uh, something that's out of our control. Uh, we do know that the exchanges are pinging our APIs, and, um, we can, you know, we can see that, uh, but we're not quite so sure why it's taking so long. Um, but um, it, we do still think it's going to be soon. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but uh, it's not, you know, this. They, they, I'm not sure if uh, uh, a lot of people don't necessarily know how the process works. Um, it's not our our development team that's doing the integration. It's their development teams that are doing the integration. So um, some people are kind of like uh, making the assumption, you know. I don't want it to reflect poorly on our development team because they're all sitting out there working really diligently on 2.0 and they don't have anything to do with the exchange integration. Um, the other important point to get across is that uh, uh, protocol tokens that are on their own blockchains 
do take much longer to integrate uh, because there's like a whole testing cycle that has to go on um, as opposed to just just you know doing another ERC twenty, which they've effectively exchanged have like a template that they just push them through. It takes a week. Um, I've heard as long as uh, three months uh, to take to build a protocol token, um, but uh, so it's um, you know there's there's that I think that like core time delay um, just as a result of the length of uh, but it's even even that being said. Uh, we still are a bit surprised at the, the length of time it's taking, um, and I understand there's uh, just a lot of uh, interest in, you know, in getting these coins listed, and so, um, you know, we're we're totally aligned on that. Uh, there's there's definitely no hanky panky going on here with us uh, trying to, to slow roll the exchange listing because of the market. Um, you know, if I if, like given where the market is, you know, rebounding right now. Like I would, I would love the coin to come out at this point, but it's just I don't have. I didn't have control a month ago, and I don't have control now. So you can clap if you want, but I, you guys could, you guys if you want to reach out to exchanges yourselves and put pressure on them, you feel free to. But uh, it's just there's yeah, really look, all of them. No, look, that was a really yeah. good answer, and I really want to open it up to the floor. But there was just one good question that came through to me, which was, do crypto assets? really have a future in China and is the current Chinese government moves against cryptocurrency trading and ICOs there going to have an impact on something like one chain or do you think it's going to open up and do, can you see collaboration between one chain and the Chinese community or even the Chinese government in the future? Yeah, I'll, I'll take that one. Uh, actually, I gave, it, I gave a speech uh, in Hong Kong about uh, just uh, China's policy and its impact on the uh, token economy. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, the token economy is coming right um, uh, around the world, and uh, it's not stoppable. Right, and uh, China has been doing um, uh, re regulations or restrictions on Bitcoin many times. Um, back in 2013, um, I experienced a whole thing. Right, uh, they basically um, put a restriction on the exchanges and all the uh, relations with the banks, and it caused the uh, um, a big uh, meltdown in the market, but um, uh, eventually all, all of that came back up, right? And uh, the industry just, I mean, can work around very quickly, right? And um, and uh, China has banned them multiple times, and the recent event is, uh, um, I think September 4th, uh, it banned ICOs, uh, and also uh, we're targeting, it will be targeting on the exchanges to try to um, uh, you know, um, I, I think they're trying to cool down the economy. I think there are two things uh, are going on. I, th I think the uh, the goals for the regulations, uh, two two goals by the government. Uh, one is not to cause uh, social uh, stability uh, problem, right? You, know, you don't want uh, grandma and grandpa uh, to lose their money and cause uh, social issues. And in 2017, the market is just too crazy. I mean, there, there are too many scams and uh, uh, not healthy environment. So the government had to take actions to it. Right. Uh, the, the second second uh, red line um, by the regulation or regulators is uh, money uh, enter money laundry. I think uh, China is a very uh, a reg a regulation heavy country, and um, uh, especially in the financial. Well, right. They don't want money to move in and out very easily. So I think uh, China government has achieved its goals um, to cool down the, uh, the, I mean, the ICOs and things like that, right? Uh, and uh, also have more, I think, uh, I mean, less money move around or things like that. But the, uh, at the same time, um, the I mean, modify ICO, I would say, or token issuance uh, activities are still going on in China. So uh, since September 4th, there, the number of people participating in the uh, token economy, we, we call it, actually uh, more than triple. Uh, we, some people estimate 10 times than before. Right? So uh, the, and also all these exchanges that move out of China and, and uh, uh, the government actually banned, uh, uh, I think, restricted the IP access, right? But still, uh, people will come up with the VPN and many other ways to get around it, right? So I think for um, for the total ban, it won't won't be possible. It will cool down, 
and uh, government will um, you know achieve its goals. Uh, I, I think that's uh, what's happening right now. So at the same time, uh, the blockchain technology is um, super super important for any country. Okay? So also it's true for for China's government. Right? It, it's trying to help or support the technology to move forward. Right? And without the token, the blockchain solution. Uh, or the application will be very, very limited. Right? So the re regulators and also the industry, we all realize it is very important to come up a uh, you know, middle ground. And we, need to, we are in the process of uh, figuring out how to make this work, right? F to avoid all these issues at the same time, um, we'll, we'll make this blockchain technology uh, to be implemented in many different industry and and also um, help to push the uh, uh, digital economy in China move, move forward. Right? I think the industry is still trying to figure out. There will be impact definitely, but I, I think uh, the future is bright. I still insist that way. Yeah. yeah, thanks very much for that, Jack. That's a hugely comprehensive answer. I appreciate it. Um, as I've mentioned a lot of times, there's a lot of support for one chain in Sydney, so I'd really like to open it to the floor to uh, get questions from the audience, if you don't mind. Sure. Let's get that rolling. Who's, who's first up? Me, me, me. <laughs> yeah. Um, I have a question about the you know cross chain uh, swap. Um, uh, my understanding is um, when you uh, swap like Ethereum for Bitcoin through Wenchen, you have to issue three transactions, right? That will be slow. How did it compare to um, atomic swap technology? Uh, do you think? Yeah, I'll take that one. Uh, yeah, uh, it will be very similar to uh, atomic swap, right? Uh, right now, um, for atomic swap, you have two people sitting, you have to be online at the same time. You have to take manual actions one by one, right? So we're, we're trying to come up with um, a more automatic process. So at least we're going to replace one uh, person with, with this whole decentralized network. Right, so it will be faster, right? Definitely, uh, but uh, it, still, with the, we have the restrictions about uh, the confirmation time. Uh, for example, Bitcoin, right? Uh, is it after ten minutes one confirmation would, would that be safe enough? Right? Probably not, right? Uh, you have to take risk if you after one confirmation you just accept it, right? So still, uh, you you have to you know, wait for the confirmation, enough confirmation, uh, make sure that the fund is secure, right? So it will take time for you to, let's say you, when you do the deposit uh, from Bitcoin or Ethereum into Wenchain, it will still take time. But the, but the thing is, the good news is, once you deposit your, your funds into this uh, decentralized uh, network, and then you can, you can do, uh, Decentralized exchange or many other applications, it will be a lot faster. It will be, um, you know, right now it's uh, ten, a little bit more than ten seconds confirmation on on one chain. Right in the future, uh, it will be even faster. Right. So, um, so I think what, what I'm trying to say is, once the fund or the uh, tokens are swapped, swapped, and then the application will be uh, on one chain will be a lot faster. Excellent. Next question from Ninos. Hey guys, thanks for joining the presentation. Um, I had a question on your proof of stake system. So I understand now that you guys are proof of work and planning to transition to POS uh, on uh, Wanchain 2.0. So do you have any information on um, how on track you are uh, to meet the transition into the POS with the Storm and Validator nodes? And what kind of staking requirements would be involved in that? Yeah, I think... Um uh, for the POS uh, uh, transition, uh, we are still working on that, uh, on the solutioning. Um, uh, we we are looking at uh, Ethereum's implementation and also many other implementations at the same time, right? Uh, for example, Cardano's or many others, right? Um, I think it will, for us, it will, we will t take a slow approach uh, based on the current uh, current design and. Um, uh, We'll, we'll open it up right, for anybody to join the, uh, uh, the network. But um, I think we decided to take a slow approach and uh, trying to protect this egg uh, 
and give her a little bit more time and uh, let the, I mean, other other teams to figure out as well. Right? I think uh, there are many solutions out there, but we are trying to take a very cautious approach. Awesome. Next question from here in the far back corner. I know you guys are busy building a lot of things, but when do you see ICOs coming onto the platform? When do you think the first one will be? Probably this summer. Um, the, in Dubai, it'll be more of an announcement of which projects are, are in our accelerator, uh, which projects we're working on. Um, but some of them, they're kind of at various stages of development. Um, but uh, I think you will start seeing, uh, and we're actually starting to call them uh, digital asset issuance. Uh, if you have any other better names for getting rid Sounds of the, the ICOs. <laughs> <laughs> but you have, you know, because you, you have a... Uh, Reissuing security tokens on WAN chain. We'll be issuing utility tokens, commodity tokens. Um, ICO is sort of this like capture all word that uh, now is unfortunately almost like tainted. Uh, but um, mm -hmm. old so, yeah, school, old lots school. Of, lots, lots awesome. of digital assets. Question down the students. front there, I think, Toby. Um, yeah, you've, you've explained um, how hard it is currently to get your own token listed on an exchange. So it's quite quite hard a process. Um, how does it work on your chain, and how hard would it be to integrate all the different assets that are out there? How long will it take? And it, it, that's something we actually have been talking with, uh, to Kyber a little bit about that, or think, starting to think through a little bit about it uh, because of the, the kind of pain points that we've had. Um, Kyber does currently act as kind of like a, a, a gatekeeper for the, the projects that are listed on WAN chain or on the. the Hyper Wan Chain Dex. Um, we don't have we don't have good um, answers for you today, but uh, having gone through this uh, grueling process, uh, I think we've got empathy for other projects, um, and we'll try to, to help uh, make it a little easier for them. Yeah, and also uh, when you talk about the uh, ICO process, uh, currently for uh, Ethereum platform, a lot of people still uh, feel pain, and uh, people look at uh, other. A change like uh, you know Neo, Qtem, or Nam, right? They feel that the process is not perfect, and uh, we want to improve it. Right? We got a lot of feedback from the community, uh, seeing, the, seeing how we can improve that whole process. Uh, and we're working with uh, third-party providers, and we were trying to you know make it as smooth as possible uh, for for pe regular people. Uh, maybe one button click, and then you 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 deposit your fund, put it in the pool. And then they will take care of that for you. Right? Wow, that, well, so, wow, that sounds awesome. That would be amazing. Jack, yeah. quick question over here from the far corner. You were talking there just about your incubator and how it works for people coming on to the, the wine chain platform. Could you talk about that a little bit more and what, what's involved or what, your, what kind of projects are in there? Yeah, great question. Sure. Yeah, so um, the incubator, it's, uh, if you have projects, if anybody in the audience is, uh, can leverage our, our, our stack, our technology, uh, feel free to re reach out. Um, we're looking for new projects to join. Um, we've got many, many more that are joining. We're hiring a bunch of folks to, to be able to help shepherd those projects through. Um, effectively, we become we become, become our for-profit company becomes partners with these uh, these projects, uh, and we help provide them. Well, what ends up happening is that the, all these projects have um, the same sort of broad set of needs. You know, they need help refining the white paper. They need help with marketing, business development, and PR and uh, Leany's over here nodding his head. <laughs> yeah, 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 it's it's you know it's so you know and, and they um, none of these projects have ever done this before, but um, we we have this experience and then we're getting more and more experience over time. Um, so um, we not only um, give you um, our own experience and our own uh, strategic guidance and expertise, our team's expertise, but also uh, we have a large number of third party providers. Uh, that also that we can connect you to um, and recommend, you know, depending on what your specific needs are, legal, financial, whatever. Um, and so um, it's just a way for you to kind of uh, help help people that uh, have a really great domain expertise um, and that want to leverage WAN chain and make, you know, great use, you are great ways of utilizing our technology, just helping them be successful because uh, ultimately our platform will be judged by the, the quality of the applications that are built on top of it, um, just kind of taking a, you know, like put a platform out there, build it, and they will come approach. Uh, we've seen failed over and over again. Uh, and um, um, and I, I think it's very important because everyone talks about, everyone asks questions about scale. Um, I think they're asking uh, the wrong question. Uh, they're, they're, when they ask about scale, they're talking about, you know, transactions per second or whatever. Um, ultimately, that's, uh, in my mind, uh, that's a commodity. Um, I was a co-founder of Tendermint, and um, and so we were. I was you know working with them to sell consensus algorithms into banks and financial institutions, and 
um, first of all, they, they want all that stuff to be open source. People have this issue of lock-in, so um, no one wants to build on. It's very challenging to get someone to pay to build on infrastructure that you can like up the fees over time. So like these low-level consensus algorithms are often need to be open source. Um, and if they are open source, that means they just live on GitHub somewhere. Um, and we have a team of researchers out here that are looking at all of them, um, and we find the best ones and they're tend after they're utilized and in the wild, and we, we integrate them. Um, the scale, the right scale question is, how are you going to scale the applications that are built on top of your platform and create a really vibrant and growing ecosystem? Um, and uh, that's that's actually the, the, a really challenging thing to do. Um, and so that's what we're really focusing on is like scaling our application development. Yeah, let me add a, a little bit more on that. Uh, some of the projects we might open it up with our enterprise solution we call Lanchain. Um, uh, because some of the application or, uh, use cases you want uh, you know, high performance or high TPS, right? So public chains might not be a, a good fit for that. So we, we, we come up with uh, different solutions uh, for these uh, different projects and uh, possibly they'll build on top of uh, Lanchain first. Uh, because the land chain is automatically connected to one chain, and all these assets can be moved into one chain in the future. So, for some of the closed, uh, uh, I mean, circle uh, applications, uh, the, e initially they will be operating in a more closed environment, but later on they will be opened up and uh, get access to the whole uh, digital economy. Awesome, awesome. Now, quick question from Toby, and then we'll pass it over to uh, one of the audience. This is another one from the applicants, and they want to know sort of what's the key pitch of one chain to Australian business and enterprise, and how are you planning on building a community here? I, I, well, this is a good first start here. <laughs> uh, just I think you know, first the first step is awareness, uh, and so um, you know we really take a, a global approach. After the the China ban happened, uh, we didn't want to have that kind of like discrete. Like, Regulatory risk of just focusing on one government, one region, um, and you know these are global borderless technologies, and so it's important for us to have a global borderless um, set of developers and applications. And so um, you know, so first of all, it's just getting getting them, uh, making them aware, uh, and then you know the the value prop of our uh, our platform, and I think is a really strong one. Uh, while a lot of projects are competing over you know metrics like transactions per second and things like that, which are actually pretty hard to quantify because it's like okay, you know, is it how many validators do you have? How close are they? You know, how big are these transactions you're sending? You know, like you know, a thousand transactions per second, and you can manufacture stuff that's like. 10,000, 100,000, but doesn't really mean much. Um, anyway, so like a lot of other platforms are, are competing over that kind of, those kinds of metrics, where we're saying, okay, do you care about privacy? Do you care about cross-chain? Um, and so these are the things that we're finding like really resonate with folks. Um, and a lot, and it's actually has been a pretty easy sell to the applications and, and that have knocked on our door. Um, and so um, those are those are the big ones, is do you want access to the protocol tokens? Uh, and do you, do you want the ability to have uh, transactions that have privacy protection? Yeah, uh, the good news is uh, several uh, projects from Australia actually approached to us in the different conferences. And uh, we, we are in the process of reviewing their white paper and uh, uh, their <coughs> existing uh, applications. Um, I think we, we, we are, there are so many projects coming to us and uh, we are being very re restrictive, selective and trying to pick the best one. Uh, if we are working with uh, projects in Australia, we'll, we'll go over there a lot more. So a question on other competitors, Dustin, I know that you used to be with Tendermint who is behind Cosmos. Why did you leave Tendermint to WANChain? And Cosmos is also the interoperability solution. And why do you think WANChain is better than other interoperability solutions like Polkadot, Cosmos, and whatnot? I, I, I didn't leave uh, um, Tendermint or Cosmos with Tendermint to come to WANChain. I actually took another step. I went back into the venture capital world. Um, uh, I was so when I started working with Tendermint, uh, this was in 2015, in the days of the uh, you know blockchain for banks, basically. Uh, and so we were uh, we were really focusing initially on like selling into the um, selling the this uh, my job was to help help sell uh, consensus algorithms into banks um, and 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 I failed at it. Um, no banks wanted to buy a consensus algorithm, um, and so um, then that was a matter of okay, well um, you know what's sort of next in my career. 
Um, and uh, they were going off to go do the, that, at that point in time, it became really clear that the, um, the best way to monetize a consensus algorithm was to build a public blockchain. Um, but uh, we didn't have any money and uh, you didn't need a, a business development guy to sell stuff into banks anymore. Uh, so we sort of like parted ways on good terms. And uh, so Jay and Ethan are still buddies of mine. And um, I'm still, uh, you know, I, I, I hold plenty of atoms and things like that. So uh, I'm a big fan of what they're working on. Uh, I think that uh, I was just reading today about their new Photon. Uh, I think that's really, and Jay, Jack and I were just talking about it. I think it's uh, it's actually really clever. If you guys don't know what that is, uh, go look it up. Um, it's pretty interesting. They, they continue, continue to be real serious uh, thought leaders in space. Um, and uh, I think they're doing great things. Um, and I think uh, just like uh, Aeon Icon, Polkadot, Cosmos, um, they all take uh, effectively like this multi-blockchain architecture approach. Um, and uh, they are, we are actually fairly unique in, in the bunch in that we have a, like a single blockchain, multi-asset architecture. Um, and so I think uh, our solutions are actually quite complementary at times uh, where you can do things like, um, you know, you can have, if you have a, a group of um, stakeholders that all have their own blockchain and they trade around IOUs, they can connect with WAN chain and, and access liquidity. Um, so I think that the approaches are all going to be very complementary. And that's one of the reasons why uh, we started the Interoperability Alliance was because uh, because we saw that there is a, you know, this isn't a winner take all market and that there's a really, really tremendous room for collaboration. Awesome. All right, guys, that's been fantastic. It's a lot of information and I know there's a lot of huge supporters for the projects here. Are there any one last burning question? Because it is getting late here. Well, we've pretty much covered anything. So yeah, I'd like to say a huge thank you to Jack, Dustin and OneChain for uh, coming tonight. There's yeah, massive support for you guys here in Australia and we look forward to uh, seeing what the future unfolds. Um, big thanks to Crypto Sydney for putting this on tonight and to Rivets for sponsoring it and Freelancer for pro providing the event and the IT support. And yeah, thanks. It's been a huge success. We appreciate it.